Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles with you this morning, I hope you do. I want to encourage you to open them to Colossians chapter 1. We're going to look this morning at verses 15 and following. Colossians chapter 1. As you're finding your place there in God's Word, I want to welcome all those who are joining us via our live stream. We're so grateful that you have been able to join us in that way and also welcome Reach Church DeSoto and the venue service right down the hall. We're grateful for all of you. Also want to tell you about an event that we have coming up next Sunday night, July the 24th, right here in this room. Uh, we will be hosting uh, a Value Them Both coalition effort, and uh, Tony Perkins will be here from Family Research Council, and we will look to God's Word about the value and the sanctity of life. We'll sing praises, we'll worship the Lord, and we'll pray together. Uh, it's going to be a significant event. It's open to the public, free to all, so I would encourage you to be here and maybe invite friend, coworker, and neighbor to come and join us here. It'll be a very significant event, and I want to encourage you to pray as we um, come up upon this election, uh, August the 2nd. I do want to encourage you, please be in prayer, and I want to encourage you to vote yes on the Value Them Both Amendment. Uh, let's put this, amen. I have um, I've studied, Pastor Jim and I have spent a lot of time looking at this stuff. Believe me, I believe with all my heart the right thing to do is to vote yes on this amendment. So let's, uh, let's get out there, let's encourage others, and let's be the church, and let's prevent Kansas from becoming a safe haven for abortion. So let's, let's do that. Um, so be here next Sunday night, July the 24th. Well, this morning, Colossians chapter 1. Uh, Paul is writing to the church at Colossae with a great pastoral concern. The church has been infiltrated with some false teaching, some false doctrine that went something like this. Uh, that Jesus is good, you got the gospel, you got Jesus, but you need to go on from there. Um, that if you really wanna go on to maturity, uh, if you wanna go on to all the fullness, in fact, they use that word fullness, and you'll see the word fullness a lot in the book of Colossians. But was, they were saying, if you wanna go on to fullness, you gotta have these diet codes, you gotta involve yourself in these festivals, and, you need to worship angels. And uh, there was a diminishing of Christ. And the fact of the matter is, quite frankly, throughout the history of the church, there's always been an effort to diminish the supremacy, the sovereignty, the preeminence of Jesus Christ. In fact, in 325 AD, um, there was a false doctrine, a heresy that was going around. Um, a guy named Arius was... Uh, teaching that Jesus was not God. And Constantine, the emperor at that time, realized that we've got to get this right. Uh, we can't have a divided church, so he called together the Nicene Council, uh, and they brought forth Athanasius, who said that Jesus is God. And they came up with that Nicene statement that Jesus is true God of true God, begotten, not made, of one substance with the Father. But there's always been this diminishing of Christ, and we see it even today. Many who will hold, well, Jesus, he's a great teacher, uh, or Jesus was a great philosopher, or he was some kind of charismatic leader, but there's always this effort to kind of diminish Christ. And what Paul will put forth in the book of Colossians is that all you really need is Christ, all you really need is Christ because all the fullness, and you'll see this throughout the book, but all the fullness of God dwells in him. All the fullness that God supplies is contained within Christ, and we don't grow beyond him. You don't move beyond Jesus. In fact, in, in Colossae, they were condescended upon by the Gnostics because they just rested in Christ. And they said, you guys are lazy. No, we're not lazy. God's thorough. He's accomplished all that we need, and our life is about Christ. And, and really, I think what we see presented here in the book of Colossians is the life of the believer. Because the life of the believer is a person who's been enlightened. Somehow, God has pulled back the blinders, and we've been able to see Christ for who he is. That he's sovereign, that he's God. He's the only solution to our sin. And we trust in him. We come to place our faith in Christ and then after having placed our faith in Christ, what do we do? 
We grow in Christ. We, we dwell on Christ. We want to know him. We want to focus our lives upon him. We spend the rest of our life knowing Christ. In fact, you see it in Colossians, Philippians. Paul says, I just want to know Christ. We spend the rest of our life knowing the treasures that are found in Christ that God's made available to us through Christ. And we not only want to know him, we want to make him known. He's the love of our life. He's the passion of our life. Both Colossians and Philippians are tied closely together in Philippians. It's amazing. The whole book is about Christ. These are two. Philippians and Colossians are both the two most Christological books you'll find in the New Testament. But in Philippians, uh, in, in chapter one, Paul says, Christ is my life. For me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. Why is die gain? Because I get to be with Christ. In, in chapter Two, he says, Christ is behind me as my model example. He says, have this mind in you, which was also in Christ. He says, Christ is my life. He's my passion. He's behind me and my example. In chapter three of Philippians, what did he say? Forgetting what lies behind and straighting towards what lies ahead, I press on towards the prize, which is Christ. He says, Christ is in me. He's my passion. He's behind me as my example. He's in front of me as my goal. And then they say, well, my goodness, Paul, if he's your life, your passion, your goal, and your example, how are you going to make a living? And in chapter 4, he says, and my God shall supply all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ. Listen, all of our life is Christ. He's preeminent. He's sovereign. He's God. He's our hope. He's our goal. He's our joy. And there's no other passage that just puts forth the beauty of Christ. The problem with some of these passages, as I've been finding out, is they're so clear, they're hard to preach. Because I keep thinking, I ought to just read this. The glory of God's word is so beautiful on its own, and I'm so scared that I'm just gonna mess it up, muddy the water. But we pray this morning that we'll see Christ, his preeminence and his glory. Let's pray together, then we'll work our way through this text. Father, we thank you that when it comes to knowing you, who you are, we're not left to our own devices. We don't have to figure it out, come up with something on our own. You've revealed yourself to us. In your word and in Christ, we come to know who you are. Lord, I pray that if there's anybody here that doesn't know you, I pray that you would reveal yourself to them. By means of your word and your spirit, I pray that you would make known the glorious riches of Christ. And they couldn't help but run to you and know your salvation and your freedom and your forgiveness. And Lord, I pray for all of us. Our world seeks to diminish Christ. And quite frankly, in our own lives, if we're not careful, we'll will give you second place or third place, will diminish your priority in our own lives, I pray today we would be called to commit again to making you first, our first love, our greatest joy. Speak to us, Lord, move in our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. In verses 13 and 14, I just wanna look back briefly. It says he, rescued us from the domain of darkness, transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. A beautiful picture here of the gospel. We don't have time today, but Christ completes our salvation. We have a complete salvation in Christ. But he, in fact, they're the, both, on both ends of this passage, the beginning and then the tail end is about the redemption, the reconciliation of Christ. But it's almost as if in verse 13 when he says he's transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, it's almost as if Paul can't help himself. I gotta tell you who this son is. We gotta stop right here. You gotta know who the son is. You gotta know who Jesus is because the Gnostics were seeking to make Jesus just an angel. And he says, we gotta let you know who Christ is. And that's verses 15 and following. So look at verse 15. He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created, both in the heavens and the earth, whether visible or invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. 
Several phrases here, first in relation to God. He says the, he's, he's the image of the invisible God. Image is the Greek word icon, that Jesus is the icon of God. He represents God. He reflects God. He is God. You want to know what Christ is like? You want to well, you know what God looks like? You, you look to who? You look to Christ. Uh, Paul said in Philippians 2 that although he existed in the very form of God, he did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped or clung to, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself in his obedience to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus is God. The author of Hebrews says it this way in Hebrews chapter one, that God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers, uh, to the fathers through the prophets in many portions and in many ways has spoken to us in these last days to us in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the world. He's the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature. That Jesus is God. Jesus is God's way of putting himself at arm's length. It's, it's God getting down on our level so that we can understand him. That you can read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you can know exactly who God is and what he looks like by looking to Christ. Isn't this wonderful? If, if you want to know somebody, what do they have to do? If you want to know about somebody, they have to speak, don't they? They have to speak and reveal themselves. Somebody can write a, a biography about you, but if they really want to know you, they have to hear from you. They have to speak. We could not know God unless he spoke. And God has spoken to us, hasn't he? Number one, he has spoken in creation. The heavens are telling of the glory of God and their expanse is declaring the works of his hand. Day to day pours forth speech. That the creation is screaming of an ultimate creator. God is speaking in creation. And if y'all see the pictures from the uh, James Webb telescope this week? These incredible images. And you see the vastness and the glory and the beauty of creation. In fact, I was uh, reading an interview with a, uh, a NASA astronaut who spent uh, a lot of time on the, the International Space Station. And he talked of how being in space, number one, kind of demonstrated his smallness in comparison to creation but he said it only grew my faith in God. To see the vastness and the beauty of this was God screaming to us that he, there's a divine creator. Creation speaks. But the beauty of God, he's also spoken in what? In his word. In the Bible, he's given us his word so that we can know him. And the object of all of scripture is who? Jesus Christ. Jesus is God's final word to us. It's God revealing himself to us so we could know what he looks like. Uh, you ever heard the story of the little girl in Sunday school class and she's drawing and the teacher says, what are you drawing? She says, well, I'm, I'm drawing God. And the teacher says, honey, nobody knows what God looks like. She says, they will in a minute. Uh, <laughs> Jesus is God's way of getting on our level so that we could know him. Is God loving? Is God loving? Well, we can look at Christ and we can look at the nails in his hands and his feet. Is God righteous? Is he just? We can see Christ run the money changers out of the temple. Is God omnipotent? And we can see Christ in the midst of a storm and all he does is speak and the winds and the waves are calm as glass. In Jesus, we get to see God. He's the firstborn over all creation. Now, this doesn't mean that Christ was born first. It's not that he's the first created being. That's a false teaching of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Firstborn is a title. It's a title that Jewish families would use to give to their, their firstborn son, and then it meant that he, that he had sovereignty over all that came after him. He was preeminent and prior. He had an exalted position. In fact, for the firstborn of Jewish family, that firstborn son would get all the inheritance. Some of you as firstborns out there saying, I wish we still had that, in, that intact. But it meant that he was sovereign over all that came after him. He was preeminent. 
It's putting forth here that Jesus Christ is prominent, he's preeminent. And it tells us why in verse 16, because by him all things were created. By him all things were created. He's the source of all God's creation. And he not only this, he, all things were created, but both in the heavens and the earth, visible or invisible, whether thrones, dominions, rulers, or authorities. This is a reference to the angelic realm. That everything you could see, visible and invisible, it was really neat with the James Road Telescope, you realized this week that there are things out there that we can't see with the naked eye. There's a creation out there that's far vaster than we can possibly imagine. It doesn't matter if you can see it or not, God created it. He created it through Christ. And he not only created the earthly, the physical, but the spiritual, all the angelic realm, because again, the Gnostics were seeking to make Jesus an angel. He's not an angel. He created the angels. Not only angels, all the angels. In fact, when you look at Christ's life, as they about this week, angels are present in every aspect of Jesus' ministry. They're there at his birth. They're there at his baptism. Uh, they're there at his resurrection. They're there at his ascension. They're there at his, you know, there's only one aspect of Jesus' life where angels are not present, you know where it is? At the cross. He bore your sin and mine all alone, but the angels throughout Jesus' life are serving him. In fact, not only angels, but the fallen angels, the demonic realm. You remember in Mark chapter five, the Gerasene demoniac comes into the legion, and what does he do? He comes before Christ, and this de demon-possessed man, the demons bow down before Christ, and they say, you're the son of God. All of the angelic realm, both the demonic realm and the, the, and the angels, they all submit and worship. They bow down before Christ. See, Jesus is not a part of creation. He is creator. There's only two types of being in this world. You're either a created being or you're creator. Jesus is creator. It says all things have been created through him and for him. Not only did Jesus create everything, everything's for him. Everything in this world is created for his glory. And one day it will all be to his glory. But listen, that can't be said of any man. It can't be said of any angel. It can only be said of God. Jesus is God. All creation is for him. It says he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He's before all things, meaning Jesus predates creation. Jesus is God, and therefore he has e eternally existed. He's the Alpha and the Omega. Not only that, but he sustains creation. If Christ were to remove his hand from creation, it would disintegrate into darkness and nothingness. The only reason this world continues on is because Christ holds it together, and it will only end when Christ says it will end. He holds it all together. Do you see what Paul is doing here? Jesus is preeminent. He's supreme. You don't focus your vision on anything less than him. You don't look to Mary. Don't look to the apostles. Don't look to the angels. Look to Christ. He's incomparably great. He's preeminent. Look at verse 18. He's also the head of the body of the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself might come to have first place in everything. So we've talked about Jesus' relationship to God. He's the image in relation to creation, he's supreme, he's creator, he's preeminent. And then in relationship to the church, he's the head. Now your head is different than any other part of your body. All the other members of your body, your eyes, your ears, your nose, your feet, all of those things, they're important. But if you lose them, you can still go on as long as you have what? As long as you got the head. So it is in the body of Christ. All of us are members of the body of Christ, and all of us are vitally important. But if one of us dies, the church still goes on. But the one member of this body we cannot lose is Jesus, the head. We lose Christ as the head. We cease to have life. I think this is why so many churches die. When you lose your recognition of the supremacy of Christ and his word, a church will die because it has no life. There's one head of the body. It's Jesus Christ. He's the beginning, it says. He, he's the firstborn from the dead. He's the, begin, the beginning of what? Jesus is the beginning of a new day. 
All the Old Testament anticipates a, a sacrificial savior. It points us to somebody who will come and lay down his life for the people. He'll pour his life out unto death and then he'll rise. And in his resurrection, he'll conquer sin, Satan, and death. And he'll ascend to the Father. He'll send the Spirit and he'll begin a, a new day. That no longer will we have to offer lambs because God has sent his lamb to take away the sins of the world. No longer will the law of God be written on stone tablets, but it'll be written on hearts of flesh in those who trust in Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. And no longer will one man have access to God one time a year as representative of the nation. Now through faith in Jesus Christ, all of us will have access to God and be able to cry out, Abba, Father. Why? Because Christ came, lived a perfect sinless life, died on the cross for our sins, and he defeated the grave. He's the firstborn. He ushers in an, an, a new day. He's the beginning of a whole multitude who will place their faith in him and will rise with him someday. That's why we as Christians are so different. As believers in Jesus Christ, this is what separates us. That we have the hope of knowing that this is not the end. It's what differentiates us between non-believers. At the funeral of a non-believer, as much as you strive, as much as they strive to have hope, the fact of the matter remains, everything is behind and there's nothing ahead. That the future is just a brick wall. But the glory of Jesus Christ is that death is not the end, it's the beginning. It's the beginning of the hope that since Christ died and rose and we can't find his body and he ascended to God, we have the hope that we too shall rise one day, that we will be with him eternally. And so we come to the death of a loved one who knew Christ and it's, we still grieve, but we don't grieve as those who have no hope. Even in the midst of the pain, we have hope. Even in the midst of the sorrow, there's a sweetness that knows that this is not the end. The world comes to the death of a person and says, life has been swallowed up by death. We come as believers in Jesus Christ and we say, no death has been swallowed up by life through faith in Jesus Christ who conquered the grave. That's the hope of Christ. That's the reason he's the firstborn. It says here that he might come to have first place in everything. One day every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. One day all creation will be put in its rightful place of submission and worship to the one who has first place, Jesus Christ. That will happen someday. But right now, today, there's a group of people, the church, and do you know who we are? We're a group of people who by the Spirit of God Paul said that Satan has blinded the minds of the unbelieving that they might not see the light of the gospel in the glorious face of Christ. But it says that he who said let light shine out of darkness is the one who is shown in our hearts to give us the light of Jesus Christ. Do you know who we are? We are a group of people who were sinners without hope and God shone his light in our hearts. And he peeled back the blinders and we got to see Christ for who he is. We saw him as Lord, we saw him as God, we saw him as Savior. And what did we do? We bent the knee. We bent the knee to his sovereignty, to his lordship. See, one day every knee is going to bow. Every tongue is going to confess. But we as the church are a group of people that we have already bent the knee today. We recognize Jesus for who he truly is and we submit to him as Lord today that Jesus is not just prominent, he's preeminent, he's not just important, he's sovereign. And because of who he is and what he's done, we give him all of our life, we submit everything to him. Uh, men, try this this week. Um, go and buy your wife some flowers and then take them to her and tell her, I wanted to give these to you because you're fairly important to me. And... Uh, they're kind of prominent. It won't go. I can already see some women looking at me mean. All right, this ain't good. I'm just joking, all right? It won't go well for you. Because listen to me, your wife doesn't want to be prominent. She wants to be preeminent. 
She wants to be the one that you have the greatest affection for above anything else, above everyone else in your life. She wants your devotion. Listen to me today. Christ didn't leave the glory of heaven and put on flesh and die on a cross for your sins and overcome the grave so that he could be a weekend habit. He came so he could be Lord of everything. He is worthy. He is preeminent. He is sovereign. Look at verses 19 through 24. It was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. The four there, this is the reason. It's kind of because This is why, this is the motivation that causes us to give first place to Christ in all of our lives because he did something. And what did he do? He tells us here, he reconciled us. This word reconciled, it means to change back. When two people are reconciled, so you got two people with a conflict, when they're reconciled, it means that they go back to a place where they had no argument. You and I were in desperate need of reconciliation. Why? Because we are born sinners. Adam and Eve were placed in the garden, given one rule. They disobeyed God. Sin entered into creation. It it went horribly wrong. Everything was broken. And now you and I are born sinners because we're infected with the sin of Adam and Eve. All of us are descendants of them. All of us have been infected by their sin. And we've already talked about this in Ephesians chapter two. We're dead in our transgressions and sins. We're objects of wrath. We're enemies of God. It's not like we're neutral. There's a lot of people out there that want to believe there's some kind of spiritual Switzerland. Listen to me. There's only two paths. There's only two sides. You're either following Christ, submitting to him as Lord, or you're enmity with him. You want to experience this? Go share the gospel with people today. You'll find very rarely will a person say, well, that sounds really good. Tell me more, but I don't really like him. No, they're hostile to this. When you get down to it, they don't, here's the essence of it, they don't want Christ to be Lord. They don't want anybody telling them how to live. And that was the nature of us. We're gonna study it next week, Colossians chapter three. In them you too once formerly walked when you were living in them. That's all of us. We were objects of wrath. We were enmity with God. There was this huge chasm of sin that separated us from a holy God. And we needed, you know what we needed? We needed somebody who would bridge the gap and take us back to a place where we had perfect fellowship with God the Father. And the Bible tells us that the one who came and died is the only means by which we can be reconciled. And notice here too, it says it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. You see, God saw us in our lost and sinful condition and he loved us and it was the Father's good pleasure I love this. It was his good pleasure. God had a plan and it delighted him. Some people see this as Christ kind of talking God into loving us. But scripture paints a different picture. That Christ's coming was God's plan from eternity past, knowing our sinfulness, knowing how we would break his law, knowing how we would run from him. But him desiring a relationship with us drove him It was his good pleasure. It was his love for God so loved the world. In Isaiah 53, we've all like sheep gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. And it says later, there's no deceit in his mouth. But the Lord was pleased to crush him. Why did it please him? What was the joy that that held Christ on that cross? It was the knowledge of knowing he was accomplishing for us the ability to be reconciled back to God. If you ever had need to doubt how much God loves you, only look to the cross where he sent his son to die so you could be reconciled back to him, conciliated back to God, that you could have relationship and fellowship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. It was God's plan. Not only was God the motivation, not only did he have the plan, but he he says there's a specific means that the reconciliation would would come on the basis of Christ who would die. His blood God determines the way in which we are reconciled. It was his good pleasure for all the dwell, of all his fullness to dwell in who? In Christ, in one person. Listen, the way we're reconciled back is not church attendance. It's not good works. God has determined there's only one way back to him. It is through this one man, Jesus Christ. All the fullness dwells in him. 
only one way back to God. God determines the way in which we're reconciled. The basis of our reconciliation, the Father's good pleasure. The means by which we're reconciled, Christ's blood. Our reconciliation, not through any good works, but only through the blood of Jesus. Jesus leaves the glory of heaven, puts on flesh, perfectly obedient to the Father, stretches himself out on a cross, sheds his blood for our sins. You and I could do nothing but sin. Christ dies, pours himself out unto death, and we trust in him, and his blood is applied to our account. We give God our sin, and he transfers to us the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I meet with a group of guys on Wednesday afternoons, and over last week and this next week, they're their, their assignment is to share the gospel. Uh, these young men, they're so sharp. They know God's word. And, and last week, uh, this past Wednesday, four of them, they just, the floor was theirs, and they just got to share the gospel. And uh, I tell you, I was just sitting back. I just sat back and listened to these young men preach Jesus. And every time they shared it, it just got... I just feel like I got more overwhelmed. I, I almost wanted to accept Christ again, you know. But one of them had this, Ryan had a credible illustration. When he's sharing the gospel, he'll use his phone as a picture of sin cut on our lives and how when we trust in Jesus Christ, we transfer our sin to Christ and he transfers to us his righteousness. He called it the greatest trade ever known to man. Doesn't that sound good? That today, on the basis of no act of your own, but apart from just believing in Jesus Christ, the righteousness of God transferred to your account, and you have the ability to have perfect fellowship with God the Father, the one who made you, loved you, and sent his son to die for you. That's the gospel. It's the reason we give Christ first place in everything. Paul says, through him, I say whether things on earth or things in heaven... When Christ returns, as we study in Revelation, Jesus will bring everything back to where it was supposed to be. Again, th this does not mean that everyone will experience forgiveness and salvation, but that one day Christ will bring all things under his rule. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We've seen this in the book of Revelation. So when it says that all things will be reconciled to him, things in heaven and earth. It doesn't mean that everybody will know his salvation or his forgiveness, but one day everyone and everything will be brought under his perfect rule. You know, the, the, the illustration, trying to figure out a way to illustrate this. Uh, I don't know if when you were little and you had kids, or when you had kids, when you were younger, when you had kids, uh, I don't know if you ever had a situation where your kid was being a little disruptive, maybe crying, screaming, whatever, and what we would do is you just pull out one of them pacifiers, you just plug it in their mouth, you know? And uh, <laughs> it was, they weren't reconciled in the sense that our two boys were saying, oh, thank you for plugging my mouth with this pacifier. But they were silenced. And listen to me in a similar way. One day, not every person will know Christ's salvation is forgiveness. But this world that likes to mock God and make fun of him and reject him, one day the world will be silenced before him. And all things will be brought back underneath the headship of Jesus Christ. See, the message of scripture is, you either bow to him today willingly, you acknowledge that he is Christ, you acknowledge that he is preeminent, you acknowledge that he's the only source of salvation, you submit to him as Lord today, and you know his salvation, his forgiveness, his freedom, or one day you will bow forcibly as he extends his scepter and returns as king of kings and lord of lords. But everybody's gonna bow. It's all gonna be reconciled back to him. And so we give Christ first place. This is who Christ is. Preeminent in every area of our life. It's the beauty of our salvation. We come to Christ, not because we think our way in. I love how he describes this here. It's not like we, we learn about Christ and creator and we do all this theological in, introspection and we look and then all of a sudden we come to the realization of Christ. No, we come to faith in Christ, not through our own efforts, but God just shines the light of the gospel in our hearts and we come to the knowledge that we're a sinner, he's our savior, and it's like at the moment we trust in Christ, he transports us to the top of Mount Everest, spiritually speaking, and for the rest of our lives, we explore the glories of God's range and his treasure that he's given to us, 
and we just cling to him. That all of our life is knowing him. All of our life is following him. He's our joy. He's our goal. He's our strength. He's all we need. And then, then you take that final breath. I've had the privilege recently to be with some men in their final days as they're taking that last breath. The one that sticks out to me, it was Ron Pence. And Ron Pence, at the end, all he kept saying over and over again is, help me, Jesus, help me, Jesus. I, he would tell everybody he wasn't in pain, but we think he was a little bit of pain. He's just saying, help me, Jesus, help me, Jesus. And then finally, he took that last breath. And the glory of it is he's crying, help me, Jesus. And I think at the moment he took that last breath, he opened his eyes, and there was Christ with his arms. And he dragged him, and he wrapped him up. That's the joy of knowing Christ. He's preeminent. Our life, our joy, our goal, our prize. Can I ask you, if you know him today, is he first in your life? If you were to examine your life today, is he first in your life? Is he first in your time? I learned from one of my mentors long ago, he'd say this, early, first, or nothing. Does Christ get the first part of your day? You give the best of your life to him. Is he first in your finances? Listen, I'm not a guy who talks about money much here. You come to Lenox the Baptist, not often. Unless he comes up in God's word, I don't bring it up. But let me tell you something. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Could we tell what Christ was to you by looking at your banking account? Listen to me, he didn't come so he could be your weekend hobby. Jesus doesn't play second fiddle to anybody. He's either Lord of all or not Lord at all. And then if you're here this morning and you don't know Christ, you know, C.S. Lewis was the one who said, Jesus, there's only three options for Jesus. Because listen, Jesus claimed to be God. God says he's God. Paul says he's God. Scripture's clear. So you only got three options. Either number one, he's a liar. Because he says he's God. He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to Father but through me. Philip said, we, we want to see God. He said, Philip, you've been so long with me. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I'm God. So listen, don't tell me he's a good teacher. Because good teachers don't lie about who they are. So he's either a liar or number two, he's a lunatic. He did crazy. Because that's what crazy people do. They go around telling people something that they're not. And then there's the third and final option. He's either a liar, lunatic, or he's Lord. Or he is who he said he was. In my prayer today, somehow through the proclamation of God's word and the Holy Spirit, somehow the blinders have been pulled back so you could see Christ for who he is. And you would run to him today and you know his salvation, his freedom, and his forgiveness. But he is, as we sang earlier, he's worthy. Now I had a song, more, more often than not, there's a song that kind of comes to my mind as I'm studying. It's an oldie. It's not, it's not old in the terms of our hymns. It's kind of more of a praise, but it is old. In fact, I mentioned it in the first service, and Bill admitted, I'm surprised, he admitted that on the way up, he was like, I don't know. I stumped him, in other words. But I didn't stump him, because once he got there, guess what? He knew it, read us right into it. But I almost got you, Bill. Almost got you. But there's an old praise hymn we used to do in church, and it's called Worthy. See if you recognize this, worthy of worship, worthy of praise, worthy of honor and glory, worthy of all the glad songs we can sing, worthy of all the offerings we bring. You are worthy, Father, Creator. You are worthy, Savior, Sustainer. You are worthy, worthy and wonderful, worthy of worship and praise. We don't have the the, the words up this morning. Whenever there's not words, it's my fault, all right? So don't blame anybody but me because sometimes I haven't decided on the song until Sunday morning. But I'm gonna give you the words, but we gotta stand, we gotta sing this. Worthy of worship, worthy of praise, worthy of honor and glory, worthy of all the glad songs we can sing, worthy of all the offerings we bring. Let's sing that verse this morning. 
Worthy of worship, worthy of praise, worthy honor and glory, worthy of all the glad songs we can sing, worthy of all of the offerings we bring. You are worthy, Father Creator. Father, Creator, you are worthy. Savior, Sustainer, Savior, Sustainer, you are worthy, worthy and wonderful, worthy of worship and praise. Father, we declare that you are worthy. Jesus, in light of what you've done for us in the giving up of glory, condescending to this earth, taking on human flesh, dying on a cross for our sins, placed in a tomb and overcoming the grave on the third day, in light of what you've done, ascended to the Father, seated at the right hand of God, interceding on our behalf, in light of who you are, as supreme and sovereign in light of what you have done in your sacrifice for our salvation. There's only one logical response and that's to lay all of our life down before you in service. Not because we have to, but because we have to. And knowing that in giving our life to you, we'll return back to where we should be and we find joy and peace and purpose and meaning. Lord, I pray if there's anybody here that's never done that, they've never submitted to your lordship, trusted in you as Savior. God, I pray that you would work in their heart. God, for those of us that do know you, convict us where we've, we've diminished your place. We've put other things ahead of you. We've lost sight of your preeminence, your sovereignty, your supremacy. God, I pray we would put you first in our lives, in our marriages, in our families, in our homes, in our workplace, in our vocation. You are worthy. Lord, we love you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.